podcast with as game time decision i'm chris i'm tyler i'm mark i'm joe all right let's get right into it the red Sox. they suck tough night last night big collapse um 2011 all over again a bod they traded for him at the trade deadline big letdown after price stayed in what are you guys thoughts well if you check my twitter at spinny the guinea you should also check out at gt decision Underscore? Uh, 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 no, G time decision. G time decision okay. underscore. G time decision underscore. Brand new Twitter account. Brand new, just made. So, um, I tweeted right after, um, Martin got that single. So after Zanino hit his homer, the second hit of the inning, I said, "Pull price. This inning will get ugly," and I gave reference of that exact time. And then, if you go check, I was right. Five innings. So you think that price should have been pulled sooner? He should yeah. have been. Yeah, right after. I the think Martin as, single. I think as soon as you. I think it's whether you guys cruising, whether you guys are no hitter. If you're in a close game, especially, you should always have guys warming in the pen. Turn to your good bullpen. You, if you, if you, once you're in the seventh inning, no matter what, it can't hurt to have guys warming up in the pen. So I think that's what Farrell should have done. But Farrell should be fired. He's terrible. All right, terrible. Joe. So you're a big prospects guy, huh? Oh yeah. So in terms of prospects, how do you think that trade deadline went for the Red Sox? Um, I thought it was good, and I'm a Chris Sale guy. I think he's the second best pitcher in the AL behind Aaron Sanchez. I think he's a top. <laughs> Five pitcher in the MLB. I mean, the guy's absolutely filthy, and he's proven, and he's young, and he's under contract. I love him, but I still would not have traded Moncada and Benintendi. I would I have given up. I completely agree with Joe. Uh, I I was fearing that Dombrowski, as aggressive as he was, is, was going to trade one of those two, or maybe even both, for a guy like Sale to make a run because obviously the pitching hasn't has been subpar up to this point. But I'm really happy that they didn't pull the trigger. And hey, now we got Ben Attendee up on the uh, big league team. But uh, the other tra- the trade that the Red Sox did end up making for uh, Abad, not looking too good after day one. Well, I believe Pat Light was a um, first round pick, and he threw gas. But yeah, one thing I wanted to say as I thought of a trade for sale that I would have absolutely loved, and that would go. not involve any of our prospects. Well, it would have involved maybe one of our prospects. But not, neither Benintendi nor Mancata would be involved, and I honestly think the White Sox would consider this. So number one, I would trade Drew Pomeranz because I think he still might have some value, and I think that they want to sell to the fa- they would want to sell to the fans that hey, we're not giving up. We're, yes, we're giving away Chris Hale, but we're getting away a solid left-hander who is not a, as obviously as good as Chris Hale, but still a very good young pitcher who mm-hmm. has a similar contract. Then I would have given up Jackie Bradley. Because I honestly think that Jackie Bradley... His value will probably never be higher. I, I would have traded him in the offseason last year because I thought that that was that month of August where he batted like 380. That I would have been that. a huge mistake if they traded him last year. I, I, I know, but I still would have done it. But now, you know what? I think his value is sky high. And honestly, would any of you be surprised if he batted 220 last, next year? Yes. I could see it. Yes, I, I, I would be surprised. He's a legit I would now. not be surprised whatsoever. I think a trade for Chris Sale is something you have to make. I mean, he's on a just an incredible contract. I mean, I'd give up Moncada. I'd give up Benintendi. He is on a very good I contract. I would rather give up Jackie Bradley than well, Moncada. I mean, Benintendi. obviously. But like, why, why obviously? He's batting 293. You know, Moncada is you wouldn't, be like the second coming. That's not, I mean, that's not really a debate. No, one, no one's saying they'd rather trade Moncada than Jackie Bradley. Okay, so Pomeranz. I mean, it's just it's Jack. very rare to get a guy like a Chris Sale in a trade. All right, do you think, think the White Sox would do, do this? It. Drew Pomeranz, um, Jackie Bradley, and Rafael Devers, who's the number 23 prospect in the MLB. Do you think that gets it done? Maybe. And for I think that might. And it might. Also, I think they'd, they'd consider. And also, you have to think about this. Look at it this way. Think about it as Anderson Espinosa, Rafael Devers, and Jackie Bradley Jr. I think that's how, more enticing. How old is Chris Sale? 27? Chris Sale's the same age as Pomeranz. So, yeah, He's 27. Just, you have to make that trade. Because if you get a guy like Chris Hill, it sets you up to compete for not only this year, but years to come. But, Mark, you have to understand the window with this young core, Bogarts, Betts, Bradley, and more coming up in the Myers is so big that you don't – I, the I wouldn't – The window's right now. 
I wouldn't necessarily go all in this year yeah. when you have You're not when you have but I would four or five Rich years Hill. with getting, these with these young guys right, so who you, are you want to stock studs up, of the future. You want to stock up on prospects, but it, no. yes, these these guys we have are pretty much still prospects. They're so they have so much career left in them. Exactly. I mean, I'm not saying no, you're going all listen, in because no, you're here's my thing. But you, but he you'd have to give up a king's ransom for Chris a guy Sale. like Chris Sale. All right, but we don't have a Chris <laughs> Sale. Uh, honestly, what about Jose Quintana, Drew Pomeranz, mm. and I, I wouldn't give up Jackie Bradley, but let's say Drew Pomeranz and I don't know. Quintana has been a little streaky this year. Oh, you know he's been very good. He's good nice. Pitcher. He's he's a very good pitcher. He's a very, solid. He's underrated because he's, he's a solid. What if if you say anything less than a two, then you're wrong. He's a. He's, he's arguably a one. His he's arguably numbers, a one. His numbers are. Ace and worthy. and he's pitching in the AL. So he, he is pitching in the AL. That's true. And pitching in the Wait, AL Central. Look, and that that that. I, I don't know. Don't will, don't look, kill Drew Pomerantz yet. Drew Pomerantz let him, blows. let him get adjusted. You all you both are saying right now that you we have all these big prospects are coming up. You're not winning anything if you don't have pitching with all those prospects. You're not winning. I know, and that's anything. the thing. So you Honestly, go out, get Chris you know who I really want is Lucas Giolito, and I think that the Yankees, as On much as Nationals? I praise them, yes. As much How as are I, you gonna get him? I mean, they I, should have traded Andrew Miller for. They should have traded Giolito. Okay, it looks. Would you rather have? I think Giolito's number four. Would you, would you rather have that guy, or would you rather have twenty-two, um, Frazier yeah, and ninety-three, um, trade. Justice Sheffield? So, it, it's almost like a ponies for a horse. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I would have gone. I would have traded Giolito, and you probably could have milked out one more guy. So that transitions us into the overall yeah. trade deadline of the MLB. Um, a lot of guys, a lot of moving pieces. Carlos Beltran and Jonathan Lucroy go to the Rangers. The, the Rangers Yankees. And, and Jeffries. Is that it? Jeffries, yeah, the yep. closer. Uh, the Yankees, a couple S- days ago, traded Andrew out. Miller. Yep. They traded they, um, the deadline. New York they, All right. tra- they traded Chapman as well. All right, let, let's just go around. Grades. What would you give um, each team? What, what would you give the Red Sox? Not just the trade deadline, but Pomeranz and also Aaron um, Hill. Hit, Aaron Hill um, I. I, I I'd say slightly above average, B plus. B plus. What do you give them? I'd probably give them B minus. C, even C. F minus. <laughs> actually, no F because I actually like Brad Ziegler. <laughs> but Brad Ziegler, yeah, he's, I like Ziegler. Like Hot takes only, like huh? Hill. But, Aaron Hill is just a good utility. Yeah, yeah Aaron I Hill's mean they didn't give up pickup. much for him, and I mean Ziegler they practically stole away because I mean he's still a solid reliever. I mean he doesn't light up the radar gun like a Miller, and he's not as good as a Miller, but he's still a very, very good reliever. And you, there were two Basabis in the system, one who was 11th and one who was 19th. What? We got it for the um, bad I'm not, Basabi. You can't give the guy, you can't give the Red Sox an F- minus because they have pieces. Like, when you look at the rotation... If I know, David but Drew Pomerantz trade is one of the worst trades in MLB history. I, I agree. Yeah. Well, not that. An F- that's minus, terrible. An F- minus like, would be David firing Price. their whole staff and selling everyone who hits the ball. You know if what David I mean? David Price so, can turn it on. That's the biggest acquisition you're going to get. Oh, like you have Price, you have Porcello, you have Stephen Wright, you have Porcello is they the have, ace of the staff. They ha- Rodriguez. If these guys can all pitch like they're supposed to pitch, you'll be fine. Mark is exactly right. They have pieces currently on the team who, if they play all, clo- even close to their what they're supposed to be, but what Stephen Wright's supposed addition, to be? What's Stephen Wright's? In not, addition, no. In see, addition to the guys who are playing, that's ideal, who are playing now, over their the head, you can't bank on guys. They, they should be a playoff. Team. You can't just say, the, "Oh, I expect minimum. David Price to perform better." Exactly. And I expect Stephen Wright to perform the right. same because Stephen Wright is a. I don't guy. expect Stephen Wright to perform the same. Okay. But I, I, if Steve, Wait, even so it, who are we grading in this deadline? Dombrowski or the Red Sox players? Dombrowski. Dombrowski. Well, I mean, you can't f- uh, fault Dombrowski for the players being terrible. And uh, yeah, but I was, it was uh, he brings them in okay. because what their track record is, what they're supposed. What's to be, Drew Pomeranz's track record other than a few um, months? And and, he's been and effective. I don't think he's a starter. I mean, he this is the first year he's ever gone over 100 he's innings. A, uh, you're trading the number 20 prospect in all of baseball. Whether you think that's valuable or not, it's, a lot of teams see value in that. Mm. You could, you could have. I mean, a, Drew Pomeranz has only made three yeah. what three starts. You, I mean, you can't kill him yet. I, I was telling him was good. It was okay. Like yeah. And I just want to throw let him get adjusted. You can't you can't hold guys from the trade block and say, "Well, I expect him to play this well." You know, you have to look at the way he's playing. You can't be, "Oh yeah, he has to play this good, and we'll be all set." Well, obviously, if everyone played at their best. What team do we all think won the trade? The New York, New York Yankees. Yankees. The Rangers. New York Yankees. The Yankees system Yankees. is loaded. Now. loaded. Labor Torres, Aaron Judge, Mateo. They called up Sanchez, Clint Frazier, now. Clint Frazier, uh, Justice Sheffield. I think I think Aaron it's Judge. absurd that the Cubs gave up their number one Except prospect for, for a like half a year of Araldis Chapman. He, he could resign. You don't know. I thought that was 
because you know what? I like the movie. It, it's honestly, everywhere. that movie is completely contingent on if they win the World Series this year. If they don't win the World Series this year, then that was a major mistake. They don't have a spot for Torres anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that team I like is loaded. Uh, they're they're yeah. a really good team right now, and they're going for it. Honestly, as crazy as it sounds. As this would sound a couple of years ago, the Cubs are really World Series or bust. Would you say? Would oh, you agree? Without a doubt, sin duda. E- even with the big window that they have, uh, they they've been. I mean, uh, I know they've been mediocre since the All Star break, but yeah. I don't know. I think I'd say it's World Series or bust for them. Um, any thoughts about Benatendi getting called up? I uh, I worry. Two at bats last night, zero for two, struck out to end the game. I, I'm 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 worried that they called him up too soon. Me too. I mean, it could either be Mookie Betts, where Mookie Betts came up in 2014, hit five home runs in, I think, 50 games mm-hmm. or whatever, and he showed, like, he showed a lot of promise. He showed promise, Because yeah. he was, um, raised, like, blazing through the system. But Mookie Betts wasn't as highly regarded as Benintendi. Benintendi was the seventh overall pick last year. He was just drafted a, less than a year ago. I, I know, but I think that ha- if Blake Swihart and Chris Young, if they were healthy, he would not be up here. So I'd agree. Yeah, I, I'm just worried I'm that, excited. like Joe, they call him up too soon. I'd give him a week, and if he doesn't show, demonstrate that he belongs up on the big league team, I'd send him back down, let him mature down in the minors. Well, the rosters expand to 40 games on September 1st. That's true. So, But um, I'd rather have let him get his reps in the minors than mm, sit on the bench yeah, up with the big league team. Yeah, just foregoing AAA. I mean, clearly he can play, but yeah. Mookie Betts didn't play in AAA. Tough. Well, I mean, if you look at some other guys, I think like Michael Conforto didn't play at AAA. I mean, he got up to a really hot start, yep. and now he's great example. like 240, 10 homers, that's it. But but then again, look at Jackie Bradley Jr. We called yeah. him up in 2013, and that kid, he um, he was terrible. And then he finally kind of found a swing last year, but I still don't trust him, but... I so, Joe, damage. I know you have a hot take on the pennant race that the Red Sox currently find themselves in. Mm. It's not that hot of a take. They're not going to yeah, make the playoffs. Really. I mean, that's that's a bold take. I mean, they're, the way they're, they're going, they're, they're two games. The playoffs. They're two games. Who do you behind. see? Who do you see taking their wild card? Bid? Yeah. Well, okay, I'll, I'll go. Divi- I'll go like in the AL. I think um, the Blue Jays are going to win the division. Yep. I think I agree. the um, Central is going to be the, um, the Tribes. Oh yeah. The West Rangers. It's um, going to be the Rangers, and then the wild card. It's going to be. Um, Orioles and the Houston Astros. I really like the Houston Astros as well, but I I can't I don't see the Red Sox do collapsing. Do you think the, the Astros are going to bring up Bregman, number one prospect they in baseball? Did. They did. They did. They did. When? Yeah, a couple like, a week ago. Are you serious? Not doing that good, yeah, yeah, they did. I did not oh, see you guys know more than I do. I just wanted to take a second to discuss Yasiel Puig, who got sent down after not being traded at the trade deadline. I just think it's. It's borderline miraculous wow. how he's fallen from the graces. 2013, he's a Rookie of the Year candidate. Electrified everyone with his throws from from right field to third. <laughs> Laser arm. Could could rake up at the plate an all-star the next year. Borderline MVP candidate. And he's fallen all the way out of the big leagues. He got sent down after not being traded. Clearly upset. I don't, I don't know where this guy is going to go from here. I mean, he's clearly got an attitude problem. If he can fix that, I could see him, you know, being a contributor to the, with the Dodgers or maybe with another team so, in the future. But if that guy doesn't fix his attitude, then no I mean, future. I don't, I don't know if he can yeah. be a, uh, a contributor up in the big leagues. I, I have a question for you guys. All right, so if you look at what Texas gave up for, although he's been very, very productive this year, it's been a resurgence. But for Carlos Beltran, mm-hmm. you're telling me you wouldn't take a flyer on Yasiel Puig? I mean, they could have gotten it for pennies on the dollar. I mean, if, I mean, they could have given up Brian Johnson, I think. So are you saying a team like the Red Sox taking a yes. flyer on him? Yeah, why not? I mean, we need an outfielder. I don't think Swihart or Chris Young are coming back anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, it all depends what the want, price was. I don't get why you put Swihart in left field in the first place. I think I mean it was a it was a move out of desperation and it hurt his it hurt value. his trade value it hurt, so yeah, much it drastically hurt his you trade realize value. at the beginning of the year the Braves and I think Nick Cafardo said this um, um the Braves really like Swihart we a could, lot of teams did. the Phillies have, really like them we might have for Tehran maybe yeah for Tehran I mean this is back a Cole Hamels package last year yeah That's Cole ha- created around Swihart now. I, mean, I don't want to say people are writing him off but his value is significant and I mean and he was hitting too but I mean a uh. Guy who bats 280 with 15 home runs coming from left field isn't as valuable as a guy hitting 280 with 15 home runs from uh, catcher. I mean, that's how you got to look at it. All right, let's move on uh, to the Patriots and a little bit of NFL talk. 
So I just want to get your guys' thoughts on the training camp that the Patriots have been having. A lot of talk about Jimmy Garoppolo, Aaron Dobson supposedly having a very good A grunt camp. contract. Um, I, I wanted to talk about one player in particular, Martellus Bennett. I'm really excited about what he can do. A lot of people comparing him to a guy like Scott Chandler, who was successful on his previous team before coming to the not, Patriots but, and really kind of flared out not, nothing nothing to what he was like before coming to the Patriots. I see Martellus Ben as a completely different player, a top five tight end in, in the league probably, wow. who's going to do who's going to do a, a, a lot of damage uh, with the passing attack alongside Gronk. Now, I see big numbers for him. No, I year. see the key distinction between Bennett and Chandler is that Chandler was more of a projection, and Chandler was one of those guys who killed the Patriots. Yeah. If you look at his numbers, he wasn't that good. I mean, he was a solid player, though, who... What, you 500 would f- receiving yards? You would figure, though, you would figure in a passing attack like the Patriots with Tom Brady that would his his numbers would inflate a little bit but, but and no, that but he clearly also has wasn't more competition. the case. No, I would have thought he would have been better. But th- yeah. but you, when you compare like I heard people saying he was it would be like um Gronk and Chandler would be like Gronk and Hernandez. Hernandez was like a hybrid tight end wide receiver. Yeah. He was 6'2", 220, fast, speedy, like almost like a slot receiver with borderline tight end size mm-hmm. where Scott Chandler, at his best, is a very poor man's Gronk. He's yeah. big, he's tall, a little bit thinner, not as fast, but kind of like of that mold, like kind of like um yeah, well, I'm, Miller. I'm not really con- uh, comparing the size and like the intangibles and the and and the talent. I'm more just considering the the outside factors leading into a guy getting traded or signed over to the Patriots, where he was a solid player on probably uh, a team that wasn't as highly regarded as the Patriots and then coming here and not performing. You saw that with Joey Galloway in his twilight years. But yeah, he was old. But, yeah. I mean, Fred Taylor. Chad Ochocinco. Oh, so, I mean, there's there's plenty of examples of guys like that. But, I mean, I think I just think Martellus Bennett's a different case. Well, he's, think, A, he's younger. Yes. And, B, he actually had an all-pro season two years ago. Yeah. But, oh, speaking of Ochocinco, I actually saw a guy at the um, Rob Thomas Counting Crows concert with a Ochocinco um Shirt on. Nice. Gave him a high five. Nice. Uh, so, a little question for you guys. Um, what are your expectations for Tom Brady's return? Light the world on fire. Do you think he's going to come out and dominate? Kill them all tour round two. Cause it is Tom Brady's 39th birthday today. Do you foresee any type of a decline this year? No, not yes. this year. Not this year. It will not be this year. It will be next year. Definitely next year you will see the decline. Yeah, not I don't this think year. it's going to be this year. It will not be this Did year. You see, um, I think this is a bad breaking on, routine for him. On uh, first take. I think it's good. Mac, oh. Max Keller. Oh, so he's going to be a bomb. He's going <laughs> to fall off a cliff. Yeah, I did see that. It will not be this year. No, I don't. And I don't honestly, think so Chris, I'm he sorry, but rest in peace to your Browns. I, <laughs> rest I, in peace. I'll be at the game for all the listeners at home. Chris is sporting a Cleveland Browns T-shirt right now <laughs> for his for his faithful Browns, who will be playing Tom Brady when he comes back in Week Five. Rest in peace. Um, they have uh, two hundred to one odds on the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> I I I foresee Tom having a slight but noticeable drop off this year. I just think that age age catches up to everyone eventually. I know Tom yep, Brady's maybe the greatest football player he of is, all time. Yeah, I mean, he's a de- it's not de- catching up to him this, this I will guarantee right, you. Look, can you point out a reason why that'll happen? Yes. No, I just think why? that he's 39 years old. But what difference does a few months yeah, make? Because he exactly. can't play perfect every game anymore. W- what do you mean and a few saw months? That against the Broncos. A year. You have He hasn't played in a year. I mean, year. if you look at examples of age, like Peyton Manning, for example, he got hurt. He fell and off then, the cliff. Well, right after he got hurt, like we people knew, like, all right, Peyton Manning's getting worse now. Like, do you remember that? Yeah. I remember years last ago. year and, and the then, playoffs against the Colts, and you yes, saw that. Yes, you knew Peyton, like something was coming with Manning, like his shoulder was messed up, his nerves. He was throwing a lot of like, interceptions. Yeah, yeah. Like throwing even, the ducks. Yes, exactly. And then there's no signs pointing to that with Brady. Statistically, last year Brady played. I just think age catches up with yeah, everyone. Agreed. And it, it will not. No, it, it will be coming within next year. It will not be in the 2016. If, I mean, if we go season. back to the conference finals last year against the Broncos, um, I mean, did yeah, you see you, that offensive line? Marcus King. Yeah. I mean, you put Brady in his prime there. Yeah. You put Aaron Rodgers there. See, he's not. That's the thing is, we we have to rely on Tom Brady to play perfect with the Pats' offense. We have zero rushing ability at all. Rush. I think that um, the running game problem. is completely irrelevant if you have a passing attack. And I honestly, I think that the Patriots' running game, and it always has been, this has always been the Patriots' running game since Belichick and Brady have been together. It's the short passes, it's the dink and dunks, it's the screen passes. Yeah, but if you have a good defense that knows that they're, they're going to get a pass, that's just, it's a horrible advantage to give up. Oh, right. It's called, it's the reverse of what it used to be. You pass to set up the run. That's what it's called. 
you don't run to set up the pass. You don't do anything. Unlike high school If you football. have Tom Brady, if you have Rob Ronkowski, if you have Julian Edelman, if you have Martellus Bennett, if you have Chris Hogan, if you have Danny Amendola, if you have Dion Lewis coming out the backfield, you don't run the ball with the Garrett Blunt or Steven Jackson running into the line for a yard every single and, time. And, it's you know, maddening. We don't know how primed up Brady's going to be in October. You know, he can't work out with the team. He didn't get to go to camp. Who, You know, there's talk of him throwing passes to Randy Moss and Wes Welker, but... He will be he, eating his avocado ice cream, you not know, eating his tomatoes. What's that going to do for you, you he, know? Keep him healthy. What do you guys think about Gronk's contract situation? There's talks about him discussing a rework of his contract. Uh, he was seen with his agent, Drew Rosenhaus, um, discussing a uh, an altering of his contract. I say give him what he wants. Um, the, you don't really see that too many times with Belichick, but I think you have to make an exception for maybe the best – force of a receiving <laughs> target of the last decade in the NFL. Honestly, I agree with what you said, but I disagree. Only because if you look at the free agents we have, Malcolm Butler. We already got rid of Chandler Jones. We could have probably kept him, but all right. I would I say there were uh, the four major guys on defense, Butler, Jones, Hightower, and Collins. You had to keep three of the four, and I would have gotten rid of Jones. All right, so you already got rid of Chandler Jones. You need to keep Collins, then Butler, then Hightower. But you should be you should keep them all. Then you have guys like Logan Ryan, Deron Harmon, Rob Ninkovich, Martellus Bennett's going to be a free agent. Sheard. Mm-hmm. Sheard. You have so many guys who are going to be free agents. And you know what? Rob, tough bleep. <laughs> because you signed that deal because you know you had severe injury history. You got hurt in the um, Super Bowl that year. Next year, Bernard Pollard took him out. Um, no, Bernard, Bernard Pollard took him out the year of the Super Bowl where he had the high ankle sprain. TJ he broke Ward his forearm. Yeah, back injuries. So... So you want to you want to save some money for the for the other guys. You know what I say, Rob. You know what you deserve it. Mm. But we have to pay other guys right now. And you know what you signed that deal. You knew that if you stayed healthy, I mean, you'd be getting paid one of the biggest contracts can, in yeah, NFL and history. Yeah, and he signed until twenty twenty. So I yeah, mean, and you know what he's not going to wait be, a year. He's I not going to be here in twenty nineteen. Yeah. He's not going to be here in twenty nineteen. He's he's going to be thirty at that time. In twenty nineteen, Rob Gronkowski will be done. But but I'd rather sacrifice signing one of those other pieces than Gronk in exchange for a happy Gronk because without. With an with an unhappy and a potentially angry Rob Gronkowski, and you never know, you may yeah. Well, so without you, Rob Gronkowski, and could in make a, him play better. You don't know, motivate him. In yes, a, you, you, listen. You sign. You the don't deal want a holdout co- situation. Though. He's not going to hold out. What's he going to do? Hold out mm. for three years. Get, he's going to hold out for yeah, three exactly. years. No, he, he's fine. Him, he'll lose money. He'll come back. You see it all the he's, time. He's not going to try on purpose now. He's going to sabotage his team and Tom Brady's probably last two or three years to win a Super Bowl. He's going to forfeit winning a Super Bowl just because he's angry. That's ridiculous. And they're competitive. You know what? And he'll, you know what? He'll probably leave in 2019, 2020. But you know what? In 2020, Rob Ronkowski isn't going to be Rob Ronkowski. The, the issue is not him leaving in 2019. The issue is having an unhappy Gronk. So what? You're getting paid $12 million a year. You have endorsement. You have any girl you want. You're having a ball with life. So what? You're making $3 million less than you should. I don't care. I'd rather have Hightower, Collins, Sheard, Butler, Martellus Bennett again, Logan Ryan, Duran Harmon. Let's, I'd rather keep not, that together. Let's not just... Ninkovich. I think we should, I think we should certainly... Uh, give him what he wants, but I mean, you still want to keep a leash on the guy. You don't want him to run off to the bank with all the Pats' uh, potential and I mean, signing cap, money. I mean, uh, And you can do it, because you can cap keep, space you, can be maneuvered. You, you yeah. can keep the guy cap happy, and you can keep and you can keep a lot of cap space at the same time. But it comes exactly. down to real Belichick, money. Caps, I think Belichick is a master at doing that. No, but see, um, it, it comes down to real money, and that's the problem. Kraft has Guaranteed a certain, money, you mean? Yeah, real money. Real yeah, money. Signing like, bonuses. and Like, it, yeah. they have a budget, and Kraft is a businessman and I'll disagree with them because as a fan I look at things I want to win at all costs and it's not my money so yeah pay the guy so what restructure the deal give him the money so what and okay. also our offensive line I think Solder and Vollmer are going to be up mm. Mark yeah. any thoughts no I mean what you guys have said I feel like it's hit it pretty well so okay okay I wanted to go around the league a little bit I'd say two of the um, two of the top stories around the league has been Le'Veon Bell who missed um, drug testing uh, and is potentially going to be uh, suspended four games right it is stay four right now. off the weed <laughs> I, I, I just don't understand how hard it is like you're in the NFL like you don't why, why do you have to smoke weed yeah <laughs> I don't understand Ch- Chandler Jones I mean would you rather smoke the synthetic stuff? 
hey, he showed up shirtless at the <laughs> without anything. The police and then he closed at the police station. So, uh, we now bring in Adam Coffin to the show. Adam is a talk show host, anchor, and reporter for CBS, and he's most notably with 985 The Sports Hub as well as Nesson. Um, you can usually hear him on weekends in the morning talking Celtics. So, Adam, I'm interested in the um, communications field, broadcast journalism, sports journalism. So I just wanted to uh, ask you a couple of questions regarding your career. So to start off an easy one, when did you really know you wanted to pursue a career in sports broadcast and journalism? Uh, boy, if I could, uh, I guess, kind of boil it down to one point, uh, probably when I was maybe 15, 16 years old, something like that, mm -hmm. that range where uh, I, I just, you know, like uh, a lot of people, I, I you know, was a sports fan. I, I loved mm -hmm. to watch, loved to play. I, I certainly knew I wasn't, you know, ever going to be good enough to play at any sort of uh, high level. Mm -hmm. yep. And, uh, you know, what's the be next best thing? I suppose that's, that's, you know, working in and around sports and getting to cover sports because, it, you know, it doesn't feel like, Real work. I mean, there's plenty of work that goes into it. Don't get me wrong, but it doesn't feel like real work. You know, mm -hmm. it's it, it's just it's fun. It's sports. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I was, um, you know, kind of mid-teens there uh, in in high school, I uh, a neighbor of mine uh, to kind of tell a long and and winding story quickly. Mm -hmm. um, a, a neighbor neighbor of mine worked in a high up position with the Red Sox and and was able to help me. Uh, land an internship um, with the team in the summer. Uh, you know, I, I think it was uh, a hair later, so it was it was maybe the summer going into my senior year of high school, and I was able to uh, be around the broadcast booth a lot and and down in the truck uh, watching the production and and just doing a, a lot of different things. It was very very hands on. I was certainly the youngest guy around. And, uh, you know, got to know some good people that uh, really mm -hmm. only further, uh, you know, emphasized my desire to uh, try and make a career out of, out of what I was doing then. And, uh, and, and so things kind of, you know, went from there. But obviously that was, you know, what feels like a million years ago now. Mm -hmm. So um, after high school, you went to Syracuse University. Um, obviously has a big reputation for being one of the better uh, broadcast communications schools uh, around. So I have a question regarding Syracuse. Do you think that going to Syracuse gave you a significant advantage in journal in the journalism field over others coming out of college, um, trying to be um, trying to work in the journalism field uh, who went to different colleges and uh, like maybe certain internships that Syracuse offered that other schools didn't. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it, uh, of course, like having, having Syracuse and, and the new house name on, uh, you know, on your resume and mm -hmm. cover letters and the experience that comes along with it was, uh, significant. It's, and you know, there's, there's no underselling that, but does it, uh, necessarily give you a leg up on, on, uh, I don't know, Emerson, BU, Northwestern, Fordham, Maryland, mm -hmm. Miami, wherever else, you know, it's, it, it's hard to say. I think that kind of comes down to, to hiring managers and, and that sort of thing at, at whatever the station or, or network or paper you're talking about. But what it did do was obviously, uh, you know, gave me a, a great deal of experience in the classroom and, and in terms of ex extracurriculars, uh, the, you know, student run radio stations, TV station, uh, paper, uh, you know, a lot of different things that, uh, that I was able to kind of learn on the fly where you're, you're in college and the benefit of being in college, wherever you go is you can, you know, it's sort of an opportunity where you can, uh, grow and get to know yourself better and mm -hmm. the things that you're good at or not so good at and can work on it. And you got to work on everything, whether you're good at it or not, but the, uh, there are a million things that you can do. And it's a place where you can make mistakes where it's not, uh, amplified at the level that it obviously is if you're doing it out in a professional setting. And so it was, uh, it was extremely beneficial, but was it, uh, you know, necessarily a, a leg up because of the Syracuse name and the, you know, long list of successful, uh, alumni that have come out of the school? I, I don't know, maybe, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I certainly wanted to go there and I'm, I'm glad that I did. 
Okay, last question for me, and then we'll move on to another uh, one on the show. So after college, you were a uh, – you did some internships. were a play by, play-by-play with uh, the Providence Bruins as well as BC Hockey. Um, so was there ever a point getting to the uh, to stage you are now in your career where you kind of questioned your pursuit for a career in sports journalism and debated maybe changing your career path? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a, a, a million times. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I think there. I think very few people that that work in this industry don't uh, have that emotion. The mm-hmm. people that uh, that don't are the ones that uh, either are um, you know successful very early on and and don't necessarily have to think about it from a financial perspective, or or maybe it's. Um, just some people that, hey, you know, come hell or high water, it doesn't matter the money, I'm going to do this because, damn, that's what I want to do. Um, you know, for me, I was, I guess, somewhere in between. You know, I, I definitely sort of had a, uh, for lack of a better term, self-imposed deadline that I was putting out on myself to, I, you know, I think it's cliche to say make it uh, because I, I think you, you can always, Move up. Uh, do, yeah, move up, strive to be better. I mean, as, mm-hmm. like, as I sit here and, and talk to you, I'm fortunate with where I am, but I'm, I'm certainly, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not Bob Costas, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, you can, you can always do a, a lot more and, and be better, but I, uh, absolutely, uh, you know, over the course of the last, uh, I graduated from college in 2004, so the last dozen years, there, there were, uh, a number of times that I sat back and thought, okay, I mean, I'd like to do this, but uh, economically, you know, with with a uh, with a wife, with kids, you know, a family, can can I do it? Can mm-hmm. I maintain it, or or do I need to get a uh, quote unquote real job in, in order to uh, you know have a have a sustainable living? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, fortunately, I I you know knock on wood, but you know, I've, I'm I'm in a situation where. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled and I, and I love what I do and I love the people I work with and, and all of that. But in addition to that, it, it allows, it, it allows me to, to do it, uh, with, without having to, uh, you know, necessarily wonder on a weekly basis, Hey, do, can I, can I go to Subway and, and get lunch? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, where, mm-hmm. where there were points earlier in my career where maybe I was making, uh, I don't know, seventeen thousand dollars a year, and and you're thinking, mm-hmm. boy, I, I mean, I I can't do anything. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll move on to the uh, next set of questions. Yeah, kind of shifting gears here. Um, so, in terms of uh, talk show radio and all that, what is your best piece of advice for running an interesting and successful show? Um. I, you know, I, I think the, one of the words that, that you used right there is, is interesting, you know, be mm-hmm. interesting, you know, give, give people a reason to, uh, to, to listen. And, and once they, you know, pop your, your show on to not turn it off, you mm-hmm. know, whatever mm-hmm. it is to, to keep them there. I mean, there's a, uh, one of the program directors that, that I work for, um, will often use the phrase, uh, poke when he is, uh, d- describing what he, ideally looks for in uh in a talk show or in a talk show host and that's that's an acronym for uh, uh passion opinion knowledge entertainment um that's you know that's in his mind those are the four elements that uh that can generate success best make a show yeah, yeah. and uh, you know that's and, and everybody's different too i mean you know you can't one thing that's that I, I think it's common sense, but one thing that that you just have to know about uh, a talk show is is not everybody is is going to uh, like your show. I mean, some are are downright going to hate your show. Really, what what you don't want, uh, and this is kind of, it takes a little while to to adjust to this mentality, unless you have uh, just the thickest skin in the world. Um, you don't want ambivalence. You know, you want, you kind of want that, that Howard Stern effect, so to speak, where, um, people love you or they hate you, mm-hmm. but, but either way they're listening and, and there's no in between <laughs> because if okay. people are in the in between where it's just, yeah, he, he's all right, I guess. Well, they're probably not listening to you. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. And now uh, my last question, uh, what is your favorite part of working, uh, for CBS sports radio network and or 98.5 FM? My favorite part of working there, you said. Yep. 
Um, I, there are a lot. I, I, I think that, you know, just, just getting to, well, first on a, on a local level at, at 98.5, um, I mean, this is, uh, I'm, I'm from the Boston area. I've, you know, I've, I've say for when I've moved around to other jobs or gone off to Syracuse, this is where I've been all my life. So these are, these are the teams that, uh, that I care about, that I've always rooted for, that I, that I'm, you know, emotionally invested in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I think it's, uh, it would be, I've, I've never, for instance, hosted a talk show, um, you know, a local talk show in say, uh, I don't know, Michigan, where, you know, you have to, you know, it's your job to, Cover. um, to, to care and to passionately cover and, and rant on and on with opinions about the, the Red Wings and, <laughs> and the Pistons and right. the Tigers, mm-hmm. uh, you know, at the Lions, uh, like that's, that's wonderful. And, and, and there are a lot of people that can, that can, you know, parachute in to a new market and, and work very hard to okay. be successful at doing that. Like, uh, you know, a good friend of mine, Damon Amendolara is, uh, is from New York, um, and and he uh, hosted a successful show in Boston for a few years before mm-hmm. going oh, national. He's I'm very well in, aware of him. Yep. And yeah, he's he's hosted in other markets as well. So, you know, I, I think on a, a local level, one of the things that I like most is these are my teams. You know, these are the yeah, ones that I care about, form, and yeah. so it's, right. You know, I like I would be following these teams even if I wasn't Regardless, hosting a talk show. Yeah. Um, and then on a national level, the, the, the reach, you know, to, to be able to be on at, at any given time, um, 300 plus stations, uh, across the country, uh, and, and up into Canada, um, and wherever else people may be listening to you on the internet, uh, you know, to, to just, you can come up with compelling topics that, uh, that maybe on a local level people wouldn't, wouldn't be as as interested in that uh, that on a national level is uh, you know would spread like wildfire and you could spend two hours talking about something and and you don't necessarily deal in the a lot of the minutia that you will on a local level that that can get tiring like uh, if I'm hosting a national show I'm not going to talk about the um, the center battle between Brian Stork and David Andrews on the Patriots. Nobody gives a crap about mm-hmm. that yeah. in, in Montana. Uh, but <laughs> here, you know, in, in Boston, you <laughs> may spend 45 minutes talking about that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's, it's just, it's very interesting. It's very different. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. So Adam, you ready to get in, ready to get into some Celtics talk? Sure. Whatever you want. <laughs> All right. So, First off, what would you consider a successful 2016-2017 season for the Boston Celtics? Uh, what I've been saying on, on the uh, Saturday morning show, the Celtics and 7 show over the last couple of weeks, my feeling is if, you know, th- this team as it's, and, and there could be a trade, but the hell knows, it's, you know, it's still the beginning of August, but looking at, at this roster as it is right now, um, this to me is, is like a, 53-ish win team, kind of, the, kind of in that 51 mm-hmm. to 55 win window, you know. So meet in the middle. I, I think it's a 53 win team, and and its ceiling is Eastern Conference Finals, and and probably getting hammered by the Caps, mm-hmm. you know, unless <laughs> unless LeBron James falls down a flight of stairs and and you know breaks an ankle, and then all of a sudden, who knows? The Celtics could be in the finals, but uh, at the same time. This, uh, you know, they could be one and done in the playoffs again because they don't have a, a superstar. When you get to the NBA playoffs, it's it's all about talent. You know, we saw them exposed by, uh, you know, the obviously the Cavs two years ago when when they were red hot heading into the playoffs, and then last year against the Hawks and uh, and and losing six uh, in what was of the three teams they could have played. That was the worst matchup. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, going forward, I, I think this is a team that could. Could and should have a very successful year, but at the end of the day, I mean, bottom line, you know, for what's a successful campaign for this team? I don't care how many games they win during the regular season. I don't care if they win 57 games. I don't care if they win 46 and take a step back from from the 48 last year. What I care about is is them getting out of the first round. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah, what they what they need, they need to 
yeah, they they need to have postseason progression uh, in order to call this a a successful year. So you at least get out of round one and then see what happens. Mm-hmm. All right. So you briefly mentioned the trade rumors that are going around, and do you think that the the absence of a big move by Ainge has been because his unwillingness to pull the trigger on a deal or just simply asking prices being too high for these star players? Uh, it could be a combination of the two. Uh, I mean, you had Steeple, head of the Boston Herald, uh, right around draft time talking about uh, how you know some GMs around the NBA were saying that Danny Ainge was, you know, they were getting close on a deal and then he would move the finish line uh, because he wants to win these trades as he has the, you know, Rajon Rondo, Jay Crowder swap, mm-hmm. as he has seemingly the the Nets trade of a few years ago, the uh, Isaiah Thomas trade, uh, you know, there there are a whole bunch that that you can look at. Ainge is on a, when it comes to trades, he's he's on an unbelievable, uh, you know, run of success right now. So, you know, I I think there is potentially an element of of greed on his part where he says, you know, I want to make sure I'm winning this trade as opposed to, you know, sometimes the trade is just good for both parties. You know what I mean? It, you know, it, it doesn't always have to be a, a giant steal. So there there could be an element of that, absolutely. Um, but I also do think asking prices can be out of whack. You know, there there were, around the trade deadline, all sorts of rumors surrounding Jimmy Butler, for instance. Well, if, if the Celtics had to make a trade for with Jimmy, you know, for Jimmy Butler with the Bulls, that was going to cost them the number three overall pick and Avery Bradley and, you know, uh, a couple – a couple other things it's that's it's it's too much Mm. you know you you don't want to i was saying at the time you don't want to be the chicago bulls you know you don't want to take a step back just to to get a guy who would suddenly be the best team the best player on your team you know you need to have a a deep team uh you know top to bottom you can't just be top heavy and and you have no reserves you have no bench uh to speak of anyway so um, you know, I think that's what they're looking at right now when it concerns Blake Griffin, when it concerns Russell Westbrook, when it concerns uh, who the hell knows. Um, but it's 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 a fine line that that they got to walk, and and I think that uh, Ainge knows. You know, I'm not saying anything he's unaware of here. I think he knows that you know patience, um, you know, growth this off season in, in drafting Jalen Brown and signing Al Horford, and in still having a couple of what could be and should be top five picks uh, coming up in the next couple of years from the Nets is is not the end of the world, mm. especially with with the uh, star power that both the Warriors and Cavaliers have. All right, so my last question regarding the Celtics before we move on to Joe is uh, the four of us talked previously about specific trade targets like the Russell Westbrooks, the Marcus Cousins, the Blake Griffins, Jimmy Butler's. So taking into account the supposed asking prices, we obviously don't know what the what an actual offer has been. Who would you like to see most in a Celtics uniform come opening night? Well, I don't think he's going to get traded uh, anywhere this summer, although maybe something happens mid-season if things aren't going well. But the guy I'd really like to see here among all the names that we've been talking about is uh, DeMarcus Cousins. You know, I, I know he's I know he's a head case, um, and and there's a concern there, um, and and rightfully so. But he's also an an all world talent. He's a top ten NBA player. Uh, he's he fits an enormous need in the middle. He would instantly be the best center in the Eastern Conference. He's a rim protector. He can score. He can shoot. He's on a great contract the next couple of years, and he's never been in a good stable environment you know he's been in in sacramento for Mm -hmm. the last however long of his career five six years he's played for you know at least one coach uh, like different head coach every single year i think he's had six head coaches in his career um the ownership there is a mess it's it's just a it's it's a terrible dysfunctional environment and i think there's the potential anyway that if winning truly is his priority and uh, I don't know, but if it is, um, then getting him into a stable environment, be it that, be it, you know, Boston uh, under Brad Stevens or maybe somewhere else, would be a, a good fit for him. That's that's the guy that I, I'd, I'd like to see uh, come to Boston. But uh, again, you know, the 
a new coach there again in Dave Yeager, a new arena they've got opening up mm-hmm. this season. He's the face of that franchise. Uh, I, I don't see him moving anytime too quickly, but, but that's the guy that I would want. All right, thanks. And I'm Joe, and I'm the last one asking questions. I just have a few more Celtics questions and then just a final thought. So, um, sure. so last year, other than obviously Isaiah Thomas, I think the three guys who really stepped up and have shown improvement – are Avery Bradley, Jay Crowder, and Marcus Smart. So out of those three, who do you think will take the next leap into becoming really, really, really good players? Well, I know a lot of people would like it to be Marcus Smart, you know, in an ideal world. That's your number six overall pick a couple of years ago. Um, I think it... It could be. Um, I think he's, even though he hasn't, he hasn't quite gotten there yet. I think he's an all defensive NBA caliber defender. You know, he's great on the perimeter. Um, sometimes we'll make some boneheaded decisions, but I think that's just kind of him getting out of his his own head a little bit. I think mm. he's a, a very good player. I think the concern with him is the offensive side of his game really has not grown much in the couple of years that he's been in the NBA, and that was a concern coming out of college and uh you know we like i said we haven't seen a a ton of progression there um you know i'd I'd like to see more of that maybe this year if he takes on backup ball handler responsibilities with evan turner gone uh you know he can kind of get to the flow of the game more and and be a guy that that has more success with the ball in his hands because he hasn't really had the opportunity to be that guy the last couple of years um because he's he's just not you know, he's, he's, he's a combo guard, but you don't really know where he fits best. He's, he's not a shooting guard. We know that. And, and many would say he's not a point guard either. So what is he? Um, mm-hmm. So I, I'd like it to be him. I'm just kind of skeptical. Avery Bradley right now is, uh, you know, he's not, he's not old. He's, he's mid-20s, 25, 26, and really still kind of entering his prime. Um, he's, you know, last year was voted the best defensive guard uh, in the entire NBA, sixth best in defensive player of the year voting. Uh, he is a, uh, you know, I, I think that this, we're, defensively we're at his ceiling as far as I'm concerned and, and how much, you know, how much better can you really get. But uh, offensively his his shot has improved the last few years. If, if that can continue, he can become a, a truly dangerous all-around player, mm-hmm. one that would probably end up leaving Boston in a couple of years when the <laughs> contract's up because, uh, you know, he'll make a, a boatload of cash somewhere. But, uh, you know, there's still a little bit of that. I, I think Jake Crowder, uh, some feel he is what he is at this point, which is a very good, uh, you know, glue guy, all-around player, um, but isn't necessarily a – a guy that uh, starts on a lot of teams across the league. Uh, I think he can continue to get better than what he is on both sides of the ball. Uh, I think he probably feels the same way. I know he's still pissed off that he wasn't, uh, um, you know, fell a vote short behind Paul George, that uh, all-defensive second team. Um, but really, in an ideal world, is my opinion, I have to think that, that it's shared within the Celtics organization, is that... You know, you want, and I don't think this is necessarily going to happen this year, uh, you know, probably a couple of years out, but in an ideal world, you want Jalen Brown eventually starting ahead of Jay Crowder. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about a guy that was, he's turned into a lot more, but a guy that was uh, really a throw-in in in the Rajon Rondo deal uh, as compared to the number three overall pick in in this latest draft. I mean, you, you want him to be a superstar. Jay Crowder's never going to be a superstar. So as far as you know which one's going to make the the you know most growth this coming season as a long-winded answer to your question. It's probably smart, um, mm. and and you hope it's smart. But you know all of these guys still have room to grow. Mm-hmm. And um, my second question before my last one is um, so on the Felger and Mavs program um, last week, Jimmy Stewart, the producer, was talking about um, his sources and a supposed trade between the Clippers, Kings, and Celtics involving um, Avery Bradley, the 2018 pick, Kelly Olenek, and maybe some future picks, not the Brooklyn, not another Brooklyn pick, to um, the Clippers and Rudy Gay. Uh, the other picks going to the Kings, Rudy Gay going to the Clippers along with Avery Bradley and Kelly Olenek. Um, and then Doc Rivers backed out. So would you do that first trade with, like, sent pretty much for the Celtics sending Avery Bradley, Olenek, and the 2018 pick 
for Blake Griffin? And then if would you go on top of that? If you would, would you add Jay Crowder? Well, Jay, I'm definitely not throwing, you know, I'm, I'm not doing a trade that, that involves Jay Crowder and Avery Bradley uh, to, to get, you know, hardly anybody um, quite. And, and, and that's a stretch. I just mean, you know, you got to be getting more back than, than uh, Blake Griffin in return in, in a deal like that. I, I think very highly of those two players as, as defenders and as key parts of this team, what made them so successful last year and what should make them successful this year. See, I'm, I'm not necessarily the right guy to ask because I'm, I'm just not as big a Blake Griffin fan as a lot of people are. And I, I recognize that, that he is a top 15, top 20 player in the NBA. I, I know what makes him good. I, I understand uh, Blake Griffin. I, I just don't, you know, I, I, I'm concerned about the injury history. I'm concerned about the attitude. I'm concerned about the fact that um, even if forced to opt into his contract in order to make the deal happen, the player option for uh, 2017, 18. Well, is he going to be gone in two years? Um, you know, I, I just, I, I'm not really a, a big Griffin guy. But, mm-hmm. but uh, to answer your question, you know, Bradley, 2018 Nets pick, Kelly Olynyk, you know, and and you're, you know, who knows whatever else, and you're getting Blake Griffin back, and you know, Paul Pierce, I would assume. Um, I just, I don't like that deal. That's too much to give up, as far as I'm concerned. All right, and um, last and final question. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but um, it regards a um, very famous guy at 98.5, Michael Felger. Um, is he as rough around the edges um, off camera and um, as, he, <laughs> as he is when he's on? Oh, he's a sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, Felger's fine. He's, uh, he's fine. He, you know, I, I think that, you know, he, everybody, you know, whether you're talking about him or whomever, I mean, there's, it, there's there's a certain sort of amount of you know so I guess some people are what they are on the air other people are are kind of um, you know there's they play up the shtick a little bit I, I think Felger is is pretty true off the air to to who he is on the air but I I wouldn't describe him as as rough around the edges necessarily as much as just you know he uh, that's what he's gonna do really to get the right the viewers. Way. Well, it's you know, look, I I mean, you can sort of goes back to what we were talking about earlier of that uh, Howard Stern effect. Yeah, you know, you yeah. can you can love Felger, you can hate Felger, and, You're and by that to I Felger, mean though. you know him him on the radio. I, I don't mean him as a person. Um, and and he, he's still like he's people are going to tune in. He is incredibly good at what he does there's there's no denying that whatsoever and uh you know whether you want to call him a contrarian um or or whether he genuinely feels that way i mean i I don't know he and i have really never talked about it but i you know he's there's there's no mystery to the fact that that he's good that he's successful Mm -hmm. that he works hard and that he um you know has that he's one of the few people uh, in this market that has that element of uh, or, or has that that ability that you know whatever happens in tonight's Red Sox game um, you know if, if John Farrell makes a stupid decision in game um, you know tomorrow afternoon at two even if you don't like Felger you're going to want to know what he has to say about no doubt. it and it's uh, you know it's it's a uh, that's you know that's what people want to have, and that's that's one of the things that that makes him so good. I couldn't agree more. Uh, so yeah, as a foursome, we just thought uh, we'd really like to extend our thanks for coming and calling in t- today. Um, you know, Joe setting this up on Twitter. Uh, we really appreciate Thank it. Thank you for coming. Thanks. On. Yeah, guys, pleasure's mine. I'm happy to do it. Uh, yeah, so we're still we're still getting things set up uh, in terms of you know our PR and uh, getting our podcast out there, but. Uh, uh, you know, we'd we'd love to uh, maybe have you come in, call on some other time in the future. Once, sure. Once we get things going again. Um, but yeah, we really appreciate it. Thanks again. Yeah, reach thank out you. to me and we'll uh, we'll set it up. All right. Thank you, Adam. Have a good one. All right, guys. You too. All right. So we're back here. Uh, game time decision. Uh, that was great. Uh, Adam's a great guy. Great talk show host. A lot of insight on the Celtics. So really appreciate um, him coming if he, on if he here hears and this, talking just, to us. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, so as we've, as we've started last podcast, we have a tradition of doing 
NFL ranks this week. Last week we did just NFL teams in general. This week we're going to do quarterbacks. Anyone like to start out? Top five quarterbacks. Uh, Joe, you can go first. I'll go last. Uh. All right, I'll, I'll go first. So first off, I I wasn't really aware we were doing this, so I don't have much to back up okay, my okay. players. Oh, no, I don't either. So um, coming in at number five, I have Seattle Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson. I mean, he's a great dual threat guy. We saw a bit last year. He's getting year when, better every yeah, year. When Marshawn Lynch went down, he started to throw the ball more. And, yep. I mean, did pretty well. So I'm interested to see how he grows over the next couple of years. And then uh, number four, Andrew Luck. I mean, very down year last year, but injuries mixed in. Okay. And, I mean, shoulder problems. But, I mean, talent-wise, he's no doubtably top five. And, I mean, he just got the, what, the biggest deal in NFL history for quarterbacks? Something, Something like that. Made yeah. a lot of money. So, I mean... Yeah, just great player. And then number three, uh, Cam Newton, the reigning NFL MVP. I mean, similar not to Wilson. Not top 15. Dual threat. I mean, you can't say that. He's not top 15. He's not top 15. He's not top 15. I mean, I think that's undebatable. He can, perform, he can perform under pressure. All right, fine. He's not top 10. He's extremely he fast. He isn't your traditional quarterback. One of the best athletes the in the done. game. Like the best offense there are, in the There NFL are 15 quarterbacks in the NFL I take over him. Okay. All right. Who's your number two? Number two, uh, Green Bay Packer quarterback Aaron Rodgers. I mean, really nothing Lasers to say there. Lasers and darts, that's all I'm going to say. And then number one, uh, the 39-year-old Tom Brady. I mean, of course, I'm a Patriots Happy birthday. fan. So. Happy birthday, Happy birthday, Tom. Tom. We, love we love you. you. <laughs> listening to Game Time Decision. Yeah, so I'm assuming We know you're listening. <laughs> at least the majority of us have Brady at number one. So who's up next? I'll go next. Uh, my number five was Drew Brees. Ooh. I see him as extremely consistent. I like that pick. He's a very smart player. He knows what he, you know, he really knows what he's doing out there. He is getting older, but you can still play well into the, uh, your late 30s, early 40s. Absolutely. And I would like to say about Breeze, a lot of his weapons were taken away from him. I mean, Jimmy Graham was shipped right. out. Yep. So Colston, Colston was on retired, his last legs. Right? Yeah. So I'm interested to see how he's going to perform this upcoming season. My number four, uh, Russell Wilson, obviously Seattle Seahawks, as Mark said. Interested to see how he's going to grow. He's gotten better every year. He threw the ball well when Marston Lynch went down. He's extremely fast and athletic, so that's why he's up there. Number three, Green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers. The guy throws the, th- the guy throws bullets. He, uh, he he's a really smart quarterback. Uh, does not throw interceptions very often. Huge fan of him. Number two, Tom Brady. C- kind of playing off what Webb said earlier. Obviously, he's the gr- what the greatest quarterback to play. But you, he, as you get older, you know you got to be careful. About can't that. expect him to be. You at can't that expect level him anymore. to play perfect, right? Um, this upcoming season, I, I'm I'm confident he's going to do extremely well. But, um, you know, that brings me to number one is Cam Newton. He's, he's young. He's fast. He can scramble. He plays under pressure. He's just a phenomenal athlete overall, and I have a lot of high expectations to see how he's going to play this year. All right, I'll go next. Uh, my number five quarterback for next, going into next year is Andrew Luck. Really banged up probably for almost the entire year last year. Missed, missed quite a few games. Um I just think that, I mean, two years ago, you saw what he's capable of. I think he threw the most touchdowns in the league. Yep. He's phenomenal talent, phenomenal arm strength. He's got to clean up his interceptions a little bit. But, I mean, I, th- I think he's going to make the leap into, I mean, if he's not already an elite quarterback, definitely a bona fide elite mm-hmm. uh, starting quarterback. Number four, I have Cam Newton. As I said uh, last show, I, I do think they're going to, the uh, Panthers will drop off a little. But you can't deny the guy's talent. Uh, he, he throw. He he's got one of the best arms in the NFL. He can run. Uh, he can run for first downs. Pick up pick up ten yards on his legs when he has no options downfield any time. What he did with a subpar receiving core last year was was spectacular. It was it was something I've almost never seen before, other with Tom Brady. Um, but I, I do think he'll take a little bit of a step back from what he was last year. I mean, it's hard to match what he was like last year. My number three is Big Ben, Ben Roethlisberger. I used to be really down on Ben Roethlisberger. I thought he was overrated. But, I mean, he has brought it the last couple of years. I, I mean, agree. The, the offensive weapons he's had, obviously, maybe two of the better, maybe the best running back wide receiver combo in the NFL, Le'Veon Bell and Antonio Brown, but I mean, he's he's really made those two all pro caliber players into what they are, and I just think he's tremendous extending plays and um, keeping his eyes downfield. Number two, I have Tom Brady, 39 years old. I mean, he he cannot keep at this at this Hall of Fame level 
anymore. I, I just don't think – I think he's going to have a slight drop-off. He won't be – I don't think he'll be terrible as – What's what's his name Max on uh, Max Kellerman on uh, first take? But um, so what are you expecting? From Haven't Brady even watched that. Just throw throw out a stat line. All right, considering in twelve um, games, in twelve in games, twelve games, twelve. Oh right, uh, oh, eight and four, yeah, nine and three. That's oh no, I'm do, do, it as, do it no, at a sixteen I'm, game. Perspective. Yeah, at a sixteen perspective, I'd say probably thirty-eight hundred yards. You don't think he's throwing oh, four thousand? No, no, no. Yards? I'm sorry. I was. Th- I'm sorry. I, my my head was in another in the twelve game head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I I'd say forty five hundred yards, maybe. Pretty good year. I'm thirty, I'm 30 seeing, touchdowns. I'm seeing no, more interceptions more. thrown. That's not. Nope. That's not like elite level. He's gonna. Fall I mean, off. no, it is. A, I'm I'm saying he's, he's still gonna, gonna, gonna be two. an elite. I don't think he's gonna be a Hall of Fame caliber quarterback in his age 39 season i think oh, you're gonna notice a drop off from from so you're telling me he's he's still gonna have a better season than i don't Russell think Wilson. That, put it this way i don't think he's gonna have an mvp caliber season right. next year i'll take that okay so like, cam like newton, he has been the last two cam, or three years but then then why cam wouldn't newton, you have russell wilson or cam newton ahead of him if you do, if you think that Russell Wilson or Cam Newton ahead. Yeah, because they aren't they aren't at Hall of Fame caliber. I know, yeah. We're just projecting yet. just for this year. Yet. Just for this year. They're they're in their primes now. No. So you're telling me a prime Russell Wilson. They're not in their primes. I didn't they're say not that. In their what primes. They're getting, did I say? They're getting, years old? They're getting better. Okay, can I move on with my list? Exactly. They're getting better. Number one, I have Aaron Rodgers. Um I he I, I think a lot of people a lot of people uh, criticized him last year for how he played. I think with no Jordy Nelson. And Randall Cobb, I don't know what happened to that guy, but he was not a good player. <laughs> Devontae Adams. Jones. Devontae Adams is not what they thought he was going to be. And he still led them Catching to everything in camp. Training he camp still led wrong. them to within a uh, uh, little two yard Larry Fitzgerald pass that ended up going eighty yards and scoring oh, in overtime to going to the NFC championship game. I, I mean that throw, that Hail Mary was the best throw I've ever seen in my life. I think he's gonna have a huge year. I think he's going to be in the MVP talk. So, uh, Joe, what do you got for Kirk Cousins? Top five? So at number five, I have um, Redskins quarterback Kirk Cousins. Oh man, he All is right. he. If you look at his second half stats, I think it was 17 touchdowns to two interceptions in the final eight games. He's an absolute stud. I've been. I mean, uh, I will say this every single episode. I've, I'm the president of the Kirk Cousins bandwagon, and please, Kirk Cousins, I will tweet this Joe, at you every day because I love you. Joe, what? I thought you were going to put him higher. I respect that you only put him at number five. <laughs> Keep going. So yeah, I think I think that he's gonna have a great year. I think Jordan Reed and um and uh, Kirk Cousins chemistry. Similar year or an even better year? Even better year. year. Okay. Okay. I see him. He threw twenty nine touchdowns and 12, 11 picks. I think he's. I think he'll. I think he'll top thirty and four thousand yards. Let's hear your number four quarterback. Number four, I have Big Ben Roethlisberger. I think that he is just a great quarterback. Um, I think that his weapons not to say that they're not great because they are. I think that Ben Roethlis. I think people aren't giving Ben Roethlisberger enough credit for like. Yeah, for he how, made them into how, what they are. I today. mean, Antonio Brown is still a top five wide receiver, but I think that he made Antonio Brown to arguably the best. The wide best, receiver. absolutely agreed. So, and I just think his ability to extend plays, and he's just tough, and he's big, and he's physical, and he just has all the. I mean, just he's just what you want. Gets in a better with age. He's too. a man. He's yeah. a man's man's quarterback. Oh, so. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, number three. Number number three. three Russell Wilson. Um, I think he's a stud. I think that um, he's really coming to his own. He threw 35 touchdowns. I think that that's a dangerous team. I think that his. I think Jimmy Graham's going to step up a Great lot more. Great in the postseason. Great in the postseason. He just has balls. He's just. I just think he's a really. Yeah. He reminds me of he's a, a winner. That's he reminds me a lot of Tom about. Brady. Like yeah, absolutely. I said yeah, that he has a Tom episode. Brady quality, and I mean he's lucky and he's fortunate enough to be brought into a winning culture and kind of like come up mm-hmm. with a bunch of young players who surround him, kind of like how Brady did. Especially on that on that defense. If he was drafted like top five, like he probably should have been, he wouldn't be in this fortunate situation. If he, he was drafted fe- by like the Rams, he's or- lo- he's almost he's almost more fortunate to fall into the third run where he could he could be picked up by a team that was in a better situation, or even in the late first than a, round, than a guy like. Uh, Robert Griffin, who was ruined by his <laughs> coaches and owner. Well, Kirk Cousins wasn't. Um, <laughs> okay, okay, go on. Number two. Number two. Um, uh, this is going back and forth. I mean, you're really splitting hairs. I'm going to go Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, yep. it's, yep. it's very close. Uh, I think that he is the most physically gifted quarterback in the history of the National Football League. I really do. But I mean, in that NFC Championship game, those two 
throws. I mean, that hail mary was the best throw I've ever what seen about in my Bo- life. I mean, two of them. And he's extre- the, the, yeah, the one, one on fourth, fourth down. He's too. extremely yeah. smart. Fourth and twenty. Oh my god! He's a football god. player. Little that- fun fact: Aaron Rodgers on that last drive in that playoff game against the Cardinals had hundred and one yards passing because there was a pass interference. Put that. Put put that in perspective. Uh, I think that <laughs> that's more that's more than the yards that's on the field. football but field. <laughs> I think it just comes down to the intangibles, and I mean Aaron Rodgers certainly has them, but n- my number one guy, Tom Brady, tops it all. And I think that there will be zero decline, zero, Zip. zero N- between this ne- last year and this year. Now f- I think forty is the magic number. Okay, forty is where you're going to see maybe twenty-seven yeah. touchdowns, kind of like the, the thirty uh, cliff with you, you running say backs. This, but you have nothing to back it up. Oh, he's getting older. Well. He's getting older, but like. All and I honestly think Brett Favre, like you could see it coming. Peyton Manning, you could see it coming. You don't see anything with Brady. At I don't. All. I don't think. I see with age. I don't think you need anything else to back that up. And I think the suspension it, hurts. You're him. always I getting older. Oh, him, a, with age see, comes decline. And I, he hasn't. He hasn't visibly no, hasn't declined. This, no. This is the Patriots last year as Super Bowl favorites. Uh, they will be yeah. contenders next year. And, and talking 2017-18. But this year, they are loaded. Yeah, They are absolutely. retooled, reset. They're loaded in most retooled. areas. They have, they have a few kinks <laughs> Remember that, that? worked out. Larry so, Lachino. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, I think that Brady, if, if I'm going to adjust it to a 16-game season, because I don't know if – I'm not good at adjusting it to the 12 game because I'm not good at math. But It's just a fourth off. I'm the only one here not taking AP Calc, so. <laughs> but I oh, w- that's getting cut out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just gonna say. Any other thoughts? I have a forty few honorable adjust mentions. Adjust forty touchdowns, five interceptions, adjusted sixteen games, <laughs> uh, okay. five thousand yards. I have a few honorable mentions to add to the list: Carson Palmer, Blake oh. Bortles. I don't know if you guys got to add anything oh. about those two guys. Blake Bortles Blake is more Bortles of a fantasy a hero, yeah. but he. I, I don't know if he's good on the. You know, money, yeah. he's. I feel like he's kind of the stick in the mud in terms of, uh, g- going high up in the first round or going to a. a more of like a you know like you said Rams Jaguars kind yeah. of kind of a uh, less winning team. Um, I thought he had a great season last year. My honorable mention is Derek Carr. I think that that team Don't is gonna anywhere near the top five. No, uh, no, 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 no. I'm saying it's an honor, like a dark horse, not not near the top five. I'm just saying a kid All right. who's gonna. Come My on. honorable mention is Russell Wilson. Uh, I I pumped his tires a lot uh, on our last show. Um, and I only didn't put him on because I don't think his decision making is quite where it needs to be. He still throws some bad interceptions, and he still doesn't uh, make the exact reads yeah. that you would hope he'd make. And none of you else had Drew I, Brees I think he's either. on his way to being a, an elite quarterback. I was the only one with Drew Brees. Yeah, I mean, All right. I just think getting older. Okay. Any other thoughts before we, we uh, wrap conclude? Things up? Yeah. Chris, you, you want, want to, to uh, oh. plug the new Twitter handle? Yeah, so uh, drop the follow at G time decision underscore. Bit confused. That's it. Uh, you know, we can uh, work something out to get that fixed. Uh, but yeah, here we are in game time decision. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Mm-hmm.